Hello, I'm Bill Harris. Welcome to Life Questions, a program that focuses on your questions about life from a biblical point of view. This week we're focusing our topics on two important generations, young adults and youth. You know, life in today's world can be quite challenging, and the question is, where do you go for help? Well, each week we assemble a panel of pastors to review questions sent to us by viewers like you and to prayerfully lay out their answers to be considered. And so for the next half hour, we will explore your questions and their answers. And I'd like you to meet our panelists. We have Bridget Blood, who is pastor of spiritual formation at Shawnee Alliance Church, followed by Michael Green, student pastor at Lima Baptist Temple, then we have Ty Watson, uh, who is the youth and family pastor at Salina First Church of God. And rounding up our panel, Zach Cars, director of student ministries at Table Road Alliance Church. We're happy to have you all with us. Thanks, Thanks, you. you know, I'd, I'd like to lead our discussion today uh, about a, a, a poll that was done recently because you know, this is something that really gets to my heart. I, I've done a lot of youth work. I was an assistant youth pastor and became a youth pastor in, in my early part of life. This poll says that in 2018, a Barna study poll showed that 13% of teens ages 13 to 18 uh, identified as atheists compared to only 6% of adults overall. Uh, this seems to show that young people are leading adults in shifting their thinking away from God. Uh, and it's, it's quite, I, I think it's quite alarming, don't, don't you? What, what do you yeah. Um, I think one of the big things is that we have to make sure that we're creating space for questions as well. Mm -hmm. I think when I think of scripture and when the angel came to Mary, it wasn't that she didn't have any questions. She said, Very how good. can this be? Very good. And so I think even just creating that space and taking the pressure off of teens don't have to have their faith figured all figured out at 16 years old. Like it's a process, it's a journey. And so I think also like coming from a church perspective of yes, we have to make sure that we're meeting that with biblical truth, but also knowing that God is God and he's all powerful and he knows someone's journey and someone's stories and also allowing students to have questions, to have doubts about faith as well. Mm -hmm. And I also would note there in that conversation you alluded to there that the angel directly answered her mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what's important, I guess, to, to give uh, young people the assurance they need. Uh, am, I, am I correct yeah. on that? Yeah, we got to remember that they're in the life stage of asking questions, uh -huh. of wanting to know what is truth. Um, I just spent... Uh, three days at Passion with 65,000 college students. Wow. Um, and, you know, the, the, the main uh, concept of the conference was truth. What is truth? Mm -hmm. And, you know, these students want to know what is true. And we as leaders, we have to be able to convey that, but not speak to them like they're a child. Mm -hmm. We got to help guide them along and let them figure out the answers and just be an avenue for them to bounce ideas off of. It seems in a general sense, based on what you're saying, that uh, young people are challenging what we portray to be truth. And in some cases, they're challenging not necessarily out of disrespect. They, like you said, they're trying to get at what is yeah, true. They want to know the truth. They want to know. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the issues, too, is that uh, we as the church, you know, Big C Church, uh, have become so afraid of answering yeah. certain questions. Yeah. Um, I, I often tell the parents of, of my students uh, that your kids have questions and I want to give them all the answers that I can. Uh, the problem that we see, I think, is that we as the church are, are kind of backing away from certain questions, um, you know, that involve things like, you know, sexual identity and, uh, you know, what is sin and, uh, you know, how can we truly know God to be the only way to heaven? Uh, and it's one of those things that when we back away, the world does not. So as no, we, we back away and we stop answering these questions and we as the church remain kind of silent about these things, mm -hmm. or we don't take firm stances on what we believe you know, to be true in scripture, they will answer these questions, not by biblical truth, but by the world, whether it's at school or at work or uh, you know, just friends that, that they don't have the answers because we're not giving them the answers because we're afraid of you know, how it might be portrayed or how they might respond or, mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all, all number of different things. 
I think that's a loaded question. You know, when you when you talk about the current generation uh, that's coming up and where adults are, I think one thing that you have to understand: the Bible talks about taste and see that the Lord's good. And you talk about creating that space. I think that's so important because oftentimes young people want an authentic move of God in their own lives, mm -hmm. but they're trying to find that. So where do they get that? And so many times the church can have a bad habit of, you know, well we just need more programs, we need more of this or that. But really, what we need more of is just one on one interaction, helping people understand why the Word of God is more than just a history book, mm -hmm. but it's alive mm -hmm. and well for today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that those statistics between those age gaps is the same statistic for young people between the ages of 10 to 24. That's the third leading cause in the United States for suicide, uh, for death. Yes. And yes. so, you know, I think when we lose that hope and we lose that understanding because it's not become authentic for us, um, we start to question everything because nothing seems real in our heart. Yeah. And I think that's a big deal. But is it not a, is it not, um, a real competitive thing that we're dealing with in a sense, and I, and I mean this in a spiritual sense, that when you've got issues like vaping with all these wonderful flavors that young people can avail themselves to, when you have a country where at least 11 states have already legalized marijuana for recreational use, and this country is turning into a situation where, you know, uh, uh, this is God's way, it's nature's way of saying hi, mm -hmm. and they believe that. How do you in the church compete against all the feel goods that are out there in the world for young people to pull them down, and they don't realize it's going to pull them down without pushing them away when you try to tell them the truth? How do you do that? I, the, the big thing for me there is I don't believe we should ever run away from culture. Um, I believe that the church should be very strong in that, um, separating ourselves in a sense of, you know, we may not do those things, but we're the, right there with them. I think it's interesting when you read in the Bible, Judas, when he's approaching Jesus, he betrays him with a kiss because the others couldn't tell him apart from those that are in the crowd. That's right. That's right. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big deal uh, in today. So I think you have to go back to the the, to the foundation of the issue. I think in America, there are so many problems with uh, consumerism. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to consume everything, everything that's pleasing the eye. Uh, at least my generation, I know that, you know, we, we hardly take time to process things before we actually buy them, before we do them. And before we know it, we've bought into these things and we've never even questioned what's came into our life. And I think that's a really big deal with young people is that their friends are doing it. They see it. It's being marketed. People are trying to make so much money. They don't care about the health and, and the, uh, the future for these young people. They care about the mighty dollar. Yeah. And I think that's been a real big struggle within um, young people's lives because they think these things are good for them, but they don't see the course that it's taking them on. And that's very dangerous. And, and then there's the whole issue about identity. Young people want to identify, which has made gangs flourish yeah. in this country. Yeah. Now, you, Pastor, were a member of a gang at one point in your life. Yeah, right? when, I was, uh, when I was 13, I joined my first gang. I uh, ended up going to juvie at 15. I actually found Jesus in juvie. Mm -hmm. um, it was... Uh, it, Tell it, what juvie means. Yeah, juvenile, uh, I was in JDC uh, in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and uh, I was locked up for a petty crime, to be honest. I had shoplifted um, something that I'm thankful that I was arrested for that and not other things that I had actually done in my life. And uh, it literally changed my whole perspective, my whole life. And I was on the bottom bunk in uh, juvie. And I remember just looking up at the bunk above me and I said, God, if you could use somebody like me, I said, I'll, I'm here, just have your way. As a teenager, you as, said As a that. teenager at 15, my great grandmother raised me in church. And, uh, but the problem was, the gang loved me better than the church ever did. Mm -hmm. And mm, that is something that uh, was big for me. Uh, growing up in a church, I grew up in a very strict Pentecostal church and everybody wore suits and ties and I didn't have those things. And uh, my pastor bought me my first suit and tie and I went to church when I was 12 years old. And uh, the first person that encountered me said, wow, they finally taught trailer trash how to dress. And it crushed my spirit, it crushed my soul. And uh, the first time I ever encountered my, my gang leader, um, which my cousin was actually involved in the gang, that's how I got connected. Um, he, he just loved me like I'd never been loved before. And I didn't have a father growing up, but it was, it was someone that I idolized too and that I thought, you know, this is a better way of living than what I'm currently living in. Mm. Boy, that's interesting story, interesting story. I think part of that too, like what you mentioned, the themes of, is that we've settled for a counterfeit gospel. Yeah. that's not family driven oh. and that's not power and pleasure driven. And so both of what you talked about, like not only having that identity in a family or in a group, but also I think 
the desire that people have to have pleasure or to be high, like that's a normal thing, but it's done in an unhealthy counterfeit way. Like think of Acts 2. Like the fourth question they say is like, are these people wasted? <laughs> like what's up with them? Yeah. And then also like scripture tells like, don't be drunk with wine, instead be filled with the spirit. Mm -hmm. But if you're settling for counterfeit or powerless experiences with the presence of God, then you show up and you say, I guess Jesus really doesn't like have any power or pleasure to offer me. Mm -hmm. And so then we go to these other things, we go to drugs, we go to whatever it is. And so they're not unhealthy desires. And that's so often in the church, we've said like, oh no, the desire's bad. The desire to be part of something is bad. The desire to be um, filled with glory, filled with pleasure is bad, shut it off. But it's not that it's bad, it's that it's done in the wrong context. It has mm -hmm. to be done in the parameters and the power and presence of God. Very well put, very well yeah. put. You know, I, to piggybacking on something you said about commercialism and the like, when Eve was tempted in the garden, a, a part of that temptation came through, through her eyes because she saw that the fruit was good. She saw that it was, that it was um, good looking oh. and the like, and she was attracted by that. And that's a part of the lure with, uh, with the young people today. I know in, in the youth work that I did, and then being a youth, uh, a Christian as a young person myself, raised by my grandmother in right. part, yeah. uh, that those things are so attractive. And again, the fine line of telling the young people, as you're saying, you know, you, you, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. You, you can't in, in, engage in that because it'll lead you to death, it'll lead you to hell. But how do you convince them in such a way that they see the light of Christ, not that you're trying to withhold pleasure from oh. them? That's I, think, I think going back to uh, the garden with the serpent, he says, you know, God, basically they're saying that, man, God is withholding something from you. Mm -hmm, you know, he's mm -hmm, telling you mm -hmm, not to eat mm -hmm. of this because he knows that if you do, right. you will be like him. Yeah. So he, he comes in and he tries to convince Adam and Eve, you're missing out on something great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of piggybacking off of, of what they're saying too is, you know, as, as we have these desires, as we have these passions, um, I feel like the church isn't doing a good job of equipping them and saying, okay, what's the root of the issue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, when we come down to the root of the issue, why are kids uh, drinking, doing drugs, having, you know, premarital sex, things like that, there's such a deeper issue that me going up to them and saying, well, Scripture says that this is wrong, that's not, that's not what they want to know. Mm -hmm. What they, you know, what they want to feel is accepted. What they want to feel is a community of people, yeah. just like you were saying mm -hmm. with the gang, you felt a community, there was inclusivity there, like you felt like you were part of something. And when all we do is say, well, th this is wrong, Scripture says this, Scripture says that, but then leading them and saying like, man, but you know, just, just as you were saying, there is a way to fulfill this desire in your heart. And it, it all comes back to Christ. But yeah. again, we're kind of dancing around the real issue. And, and that's, I mean, kids are hearing that. And I, I think kids nowadays, students nowadays, young adults nowadays are so much smarter than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm, and they're mm -hmm. sitting there thinking, I, you're not answering the question that I'm asking. Mm -hmm, <laughs> like, this mm -hmm. isn't what I want to know. I, like, I understand it. You know, I, I know a lot of atheists, especially you know, in my student ministry in the past few years, that they know the Bible. It's not that they don't know what Scripture says. Mm -hmm. It's that nobody's really shown them uh, how it impacts their life personally and how, it f how Jesus can fulfill their specific needs and their desires. And so they throw it out and they're saying, well, this, this hasn't helped me. This isn't beneficial to me because it hasn't had the opportunity to transform their life because we're not giving them the opportunity to, to solve that, that deeper rooted issue in, in the individual's lives. Very good. In a moment, I'd like to come back and talk about um, programs that have been um, designed to address a lot of what we're talking about that exist, and, and many people are unaware of these programs. We're gonna deal with that in more in just a few moments. All right now we're gonna take a short break. We will be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we're talking about young adults and youth in the church. Um, 
you know, there are programs, we understand, around the country that are designed to address many of the problems of youth that we're talking about today, and you, you're well aware of some of them, aren't you? Yeah, there, there's a lot of programs, and I think one of the biggest things uh, as being a youth pastor and and even with young adults is that oftentimes once they get out of youth ministry, uh, there's really not a bridge to gap after high school mm -hmm. into college. And I think it's amazing because Chick-fil-A, uh, a lot of people know they serve incredible chicken sandwiches, <laughs> uh, but they don't know about what they're doing uh, to help young people in America. There's a program called WinShape, and uh, the director of high school relations, is uh, his name's Randy Winton, and they have a place in Rome, Georgia, to help young people. It's a week-long, distensive discipleship class for college students and for high school seniors. Um, it's an incredible thing. Uh, the owners of Chick-fil-A, uh, Kathy and them, they paid for this. It's in Rome, Georgia. It's it's just an incredible campus that they take and they value not only young adults, but marriages. And, and there's so much. You can really check that out uh, online. It's called, the program's called Wind Shape, and it's truly incredible. And how do you spell wind and shape? Uh, W-I-N-S-H-A-P-E. And uh, you can check it out, whether it's on Facebook, whether um, you just check out their website. They're doing incredible things, and it's something that churches can connect with. And uh, it's not that expensive either. So it's, it's something very doable for your young people. I've even heard of a, a program, and I don't know where it is. I just saw it as a flash on the news one night, that is designed to help Christians coming out of high school before they get into college, uh, where they're in a, in a secular setting in college, everything is being um, challenged that they have learned in, in the Word of God. And in many cases, this is a program that has helped young people going into college to maintain their salvation. What do you say about the validity of, the validity of such a program as that? I think that understanding that we're not combating the world, like Jesus is more powerful. And so I love like what you had mentioned before is we have to make sure that we're giving students actual encounters with God. Mm -hmm that we're inviting, we're not teaching people about Jesus, we're introducing people to Jesus. Uh, yeah, and that's a very, no, 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 it's a very different thing. And so I think also equipping parents, they, they don't have to way, lay awake at night freaking out that their kid's gonna become this terrible person by going to college, that they actually can entrust their student with the Lord and that they will have a journey and have new things that they learn. But when they are continually coming back to the truth of who Jesus is, that he's more powerful than any um, worldly thing they're gonna learn. Yeah. Well, and a lot of college campuses have Christian organizations on campus, but the problem is they go from this tight nip of group of friends that they knew, and you send them off on their own, and they're afraid. They're afraid to go to something and try to make new friends or try to connect. And so, as as our you know, as a student pastor, you know, my, one of my responsibilities is when my student graduates, help them get plugged into something at their college campus. Yes, you know, and it's not it's. It's not once they graduate, they're out of my youth group. You know, I'm, I'm, they're still my student. You know, I have a, a kid who um, just went to college in Michigan, upstate Michigan, and he's struggling because there's only one Christian organization on campus, and there's like two churches in town, and it's a really small town. And, you know, I just text him, you know, a couple times a week, maybe once a month, whenever, you know, it feels right, saying, hey, how are you? You know, how are you doing? Are you getting time in the Word? Are you going to church? You know, it's, it's not dropping the ball as student pastors once they leave our youth group. It's staying connected with them mm -hmm. throughout the process, especially that first year, first or even second year into college. Yeah, well, the Bible tells us to, not to forget to assemble ourselves together uh, in the way we should be doing that. And that, that sense of togetherness, even if it's a long distance type of a reach, uh, is very important because everybody needs to stay connected. You're right. Well, I'd like to deal with this whole issue of sexual identity. A, a, part of it is, a part of that issue seems to be that while a parent will not leave it up to a child to decide that they're going to be educated, that parent says, you're going to college. That's all there is to it. You're going to college. We, we, we are affirm in that. But the parent nonetheless will allow the child to determine their own sexual identity, not realizing the, 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 the consequences of that. How, how do we address that? And, and what do you do, what do you do if one of the, one of the students, one of the young adults in, in, your, um, in your congregation comes to you and says that I no longer feel like the identity that is written on my birth certificate is the identity that I want to embrace today. I'm changing. Yeah, uh, I guess kind of going back uh, to earlier in the show uh, that 
we have to find the root issue. Why, why does a student feel this way? Why do they feel? And, and again, I love how this is all coming together too, because when, when a student you know, comes out or changes their sexual identity or anything like that, there's such a support from people mm -hmm. you know, in the world around that to celebrate them, to say, wow, like we're so, you know, we're proud of you. Like this is such a, a huge step for you. And suddenly, you know, if, if a student's struggling with things like loneliness or uh, rejection, I, I mean, as a guy, I've been rejected by the ladies before, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, how you deal with that, you know, is just, uh, again, it comes down to the issue of, I, you know, I feel lonely, I feel rejected, I feel abandoned, but then suddenly you go and you make decisions like this that get you attention, that get you noticed, that get mm -hmm. you, and, and I'm not saying that that's the only issue and why people do that, but, but again, we can see the community, just like a, you know, a gang for you was like, man, we're your family now, we're your community, we're your support. When you step into certain areas in the world now where they're making yeah. these decisions, there's a huge community behind you, and suddenly you're like, if the church isn't that community for these students, if, you know, if the, the body of Christ isn't being that, the world will be. Yes, I, I mean, that's just the reality of mm -hmm. it. And so I think that's a good start in, into looking into some of these issues. Is like, what are we doing as the church to be the community, to answer the real questions, to get down to the root issue? Because it's ugly down there at the root issue. And, it, and it, it's time and energy and resources. And it's just, but, but we have to be willing to do that. I think it's interesting that we live in a generation uh, that we truly believe that we can put in a hundred dollars into the bank and expect to get out 300. Um, you can't get out more than what you put in and we're seeing that with this generation currently. So many young people are crying out for help but we're trying to do the bare minimums as leaders today. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not connecting with them the way that they desperately need. We run great programs, we have awesome youth groups, but on a one-on-one -on -one level, mm -hmm. I don't really know if we're answering that call appropriately. And I think those are questions that we really need to have because the truth reality is they're not having an identity crisis. They're having a heart issue. Mm -hmm. And if we never allow God to do the heart surgery that he needs to do with us assisting, um, they feel like they're on this island alone. And guess who's going to come to that island with them? Everyone in the world. They're going to feel more loved at school. They're going to feel more loved at work when they get older. They're going to feel more loved everywhere else except where they needed it the most. And that's the fear that I have in 2020 is that there's so many young people out here screaming, say, I need help. Mm -hmm. And we're not coming to the call. We're more concerned with everyone else and our attendance and our programs than we are the one that's screaming and saying, God, I don't understand anymore. Yeah, so it's really easy to run a good program. It's really easy to run a good youth group, you know, but if you're not connecting relationally with those students, they're still looking for that, you know, and I think it goes even farther than outside of the youth group is like, how am I connecting those students with other adults in my church? You know, how am I connecting it with them with other grandparents in my church? Some of these kids don't have grandparents. And so their grandparents might be at church uh, and they might be their spiritual grandparents. You know, for me, I had a couple in my church that really invested into me a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm where I'm at today is because that couple decided, hey, you know, we're going to basically spiritually adopt this kid and we're going to invest into him. And that's the thing is it takes so much time to invest into youth and that one person can't do it. Mm -hmm. we, the student pastor can't do all that. Right. You know, you, so we have to create a team of leaders, a team of adults and then partner those. Yeah, that's why the small group model has been become such a huge deal you know, in the recent church is because we're connecting and getting more relationships in the church. Very good. Uh, so conversation and communication has much to do with this, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I think one of the practical tools that I use a lot with people is a model of inner healing. And so really bringing people to an encounter with God to say, God, is there any lie that I'm believing about what it means for me to be a woman? Or, God, is there any lie that I'm believing about what it means for me to be a man? Um, and walking people through that, because a lot of it is, it's lies that the enemy has thrown at people mm -hmm. about what it means to be masculine or what it means to be feminine or what it means to be in relationship with Father right. God. And so when you can walk people and dislodge the lie and bring the truth in, again, a lot of that will come to the surface of, oh, actually, I'm not wanting to change. I'm just wanting to be loved and known for who I really am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one last thing I'll say real quick is for any church, any youth pastor out there uh, today, your ministry success is not predicated on how many people attend your youth group. You could have the next Billy Graham sitting in front of you in the midst of five. 
We yeah, have to quit yeah. this whole stigma of being successful as a youth pastor is how many people we can get through that door. We, we want to reach as many as we can, but churches have to understand that that one soul is just as important as the other. Yeah, and, and, and you need to have a sufficient number of people to deal with the ones you've already got Absolutely. rather than trying to enlarge your numbers just to, yeah. to, look, to look good. Yeah. Very good. Um, we don't have a lot of time for this, but I want to ask this question nonetheless. A part of the, another study with Bernard that came out that talked about six reasons why young adults are leaving the church. And the church seems overprotective and too judgmental. And uh, let's see, teens and those in their 20s experience uh, shallowness about their Christianity. And uh, churches come across as antagonistic to science. Those are just three of the ones. What, what, what do you think about any of those? I, I think that the world uh, wants to be involved in a church that is not judgmental, you know? I believe that we can judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, but I don't think we're ever called to cut it down. Mm -hmm. And I think with that being said, we look at Jesus on the cross and we have two thieves on each side. And Jesus didn't ask the man on his right or left his background, where he was from, what he did, why he was on a cross. Um, he simply told that man that was able to surrender to him that day, you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important for the church to kind of take the same model of understanding, like, sure, there's things we have to work through, but at the same time, God never called us to judge people. He called us to love them. And I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments on those lines? We've got, um, what about the issue of science? The, the, the church, does the church feel, we've got about, about a minute left. Does the church feel threatened by science at all? in the conflict between science and faith, do you think? I, yeah, I think when uh, so many people are looking for answers and they think that science is this very tangible thing, but ultimately, I mean, God created the laws of science, the, the very natural laws that we see today. I mean, God, God is not the opposite of science, yeah. uh, you know, but obviously God is not bound by those laws. He, right. he is supernatural. Yes, he is. And so, uh, you know, but uh, people haven't experienced that supernatural in their life, you know, and, and I think through those experiences, those times that we give them an opportunity to experience the real Jesus and his real supernatural power, you know, we get to see, you know, that God is in science and he's also supernatural. All right, very well put. I think we'll have to end on that note. We're all out of time, but let me just encourage our audience to tune in again next week. We'll have this same fine panel with us next week. So make sure you stay tuned. In the meantime, send us your questions that you have. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.